They never complexities. Where is job? Hi everyone, I'm Dom Griffin, I'm a film critic and you're watching The Armchair Auteur. This is an ongoing video series I do where we talk about new movies, old movies, screenplay analysis, TV show reviews, that sort of thing. So if you like movies and film culture and you like to see somebody pick those things apart, please consider subscribing. Today, as you can tell from the thumbnail and the description of the video, we are going to be talking about the new HBO series The Nevers created by Joss Whedon. But before we get into that, I have to plug something and I don't want to wait until the end of the video to plug it, so I'm gonna plug it now. If you don't want to hear me plug something, you can skip ahead, there's chapter marks and stuff. So, uh, as some of you guys are probably aware, last year, around the fall, I got two guests on one of my favorite podcasts, a show called Late Fees, and I got to go on to talk about Michael Mann movies. You guys know I like Michael Mann, and I had a blast. And the boys that run the show had such a good time that they asked me to join the show full time. And for the end of 2020, I spent a lot of time working on the show, and it's one of my favorite things I've ever done, one of my favorite projects I've ever been involved in full stop. After the holidays we took a little bit of a break and because the movie industry has changed, the television industry has changed, the landscape has changed, everything's changed, we decided to take some time away and then come back even stronger relaunching the show and the first episode is out today and the new show is called Triple Beam Streams. It's still me, Pafif, Justin, Eric, everyone talking about movies and stuff like that but the format's a little bit different. It allows for us to talk a little bit more nimbly about what's going on in the news and entertainment world and stuff and we just think it's a little more fun for us and for the listener and I loved recording the first episode and I hope you guys love listening to it just as much. It's really awesome. It is hosted on the RNC Radio Podcast Network, an illustrious brand that you may have heard Wally shout out during Big E's entrance this past WrestleMania weekend. So yeah, I'll put a link in the description if you want to hear the show, it's out. And yeah, uh, moving on to the show now. So last month, in the wake of the controversy surrounding Ray Fisher's allegations about what occurred on the set of the Justice League reshoots, Joss Whedon stepped away from his new HBO Max series, The Nevers, that he created and was previously the executive producer of. He said he was exhausted, needed a break, and I'm sure he was telling the truth and that Warner Brothers didn't tell him to fuck off, but still allowed him to save some face. Now the show itself has arrived, the first episode anyway, and I wanted to check it out, especially curious given how they now have to market a show whose entire original appeal was that it was the new show from Joss Whedon without loudly proclaiming that this is, in fact, the work of Joss Whedon. Now, as you can probably guess, I did not like the show very much, and we are going to be pretty critical of the show in this video, but I don't want to give the wrong impression that I am just shitting on Joss Whedon because it's du jour now because he's on the outs with, well, everyone. My biggest pet peeve is when a famous writer or artist or actor or whatever gets canceled and some self-righteous motherfucker has to bend over backwards to shout from the rooftops how they never liked them anyway or, oh yeah, I always knew that guy was trash. Like, first of all, shut the fuck up. I'm sure there are people that have never liked Joss Whedon and have always disliked Joss Whedon. Uh, my friend, superstar comic book artist Ramon Villalobos comes to mind. He's always thought the guy was a herb. But a lot of people are just being weird, trying to let people know that they're one of the good ones who never liked someone who's no longer good or whatever. And I, just, I hate that thing entirely. I'm not one of those people. I used to be a very, very big fan of Joss Whedon's work. Buffy the Vampire Slayer was a pretty formative piece of pop culture for me. I loved Angel, the spinoff series, even more. I was a big Firefly Serenity fan, but have since cooled on it considerably. I love Cabin in the Woods. I think Dollhouse is still a pretty underrated and ambitious show. Uh, Sugar Shock hasn't aged well, but it's still a comic I hold very dear to my heart. Like, I've logged the hours, okay? I am very familiar with Joss's work. I think I've seen and or read everything the man's ever done, including unproduced work. So I'm very familiar with his entire oeuvre. And I did consider myself a fan up until relatively recently, and not solely for the reasons you may think. But I want to remind most of you that much of what you, if you like Joss Whedon, if you're out there, if you're a fan, most of what you like about Joss Whedon's television work was not solely the work of Joss Whedon. Television, even more so than film, is a very, very collaborative medium. So yes, as much as these shows were created by Joss, directed by Joss, in some cases written by Joss, they were also co-created or executive produced or co-written by plenty of other people like Marty Noxon or Tim Minear, David Greenwald, uh, Jana Spenson, uh, Doug Petrie, the latter two of whom are present as writers and producers on The Nevers. So if you feel like I like this guy's stuff, but I don't know how to reconcile it, like remind yourself it's, it wasn't just him. There's plenty of people involved in making it good. And the fact that a lot of the stuff he's done 100% solo in more recent years is starting to show wear and tear and, and bits of, of rust probably speaks to that fact. But one of the issues with Joss, similarly to someone like Aaron Sorkin, is that he has a very identifiable and recognizable shtick that gets more tiresome over time. 
Every creator tends to iterate on the same themes and motifs throughout their career, but when you can't meaningfully grow or evolve within what people expect from you, it's easy for your work to become irksome and a waste of time. Because we've seen all this shit before. Which brings us to, finally, The Nevers. The show is set in England at the turn of the century and is principally concerned with a group of individuals called The Touched. Basically, a mysterious event has occurred that has given seemingly random folks special abilities. Not many of them big and cool superpowers, but, you know, the kind of outcasty, frustrating Morlock-style anomalies. The show's ostensible lead, Amalia True, played by Laura Donnelly, can sort of see into the future, but she can't control it at all, so she just gets convenient foreshadowing clips of things that will occur later in the show, devoid of context. She works out of the orphanage, an established home for other touched folks, bankrolled by a rich lady played by Dollhouse's Olivia Williams, and Amalia works alongside her close friend Penance Adair, who, yes, the two leads of the show's names are Amalia True and Penance Adair, and I'm not making that up. Look, it's a show about some touched folks trying to save and round up other touched folks and save them from a society who fears and hates them. It's just like the X-Men, but mixed up with some try-hard, steampunk, fake Warren Ellis comic bullshit for American Doctor Who fans and stuffy Anglophiles. There are a lot of characters, and judging off the first episode alone, I can't say I care about a single one of them. And this is a show that has a guy they call the Beggar King, and he's played by Nick Frost. That should be extremely my shit. But unfortunately, the opening salvo feels at once too sprawling, with too many players introduced at once, and too flat, in that the world, outside of some solid production design and costuming, doesn't feel even remotely fleshed out. It's weird to watch a show that is about a group of superpowered beings trying to save other superpowered beings from mysterious figures while also trying to capture a superpowered serial killer who is leading a rogue band of superpowered beings, all across the backdrop of some very broad and blatant socio political commentary about class and discrimination and still feel, you know bored. Because it all feels so familiar. When the show was first announced and the casting notices were released, I genuinely thought it was parody. Like, the show on paper reads like an AU fanfic of every other Joss show in existence. Joss, who wrote and directed the pilot, plays all the hits. You've got a strong-minded and independent but put-upon leading lady who semi-inexplicably knows a lot of martial arts. <laughs> Someone with severe mental health issues whose faltering faculties manifest in some truly terrible dialogue meant to sound poetic. I could never make it out, but I feel his arm like gone in my throat. A doting BFF who fans can fantasize as an undercover love interest. Now that he has the girl. Harry. Why didn't they say that? God, he even recycles the young girl turned into a giant trope from the season 8 Buffy comic. It's the same old shit, but with slightly more sex and slightly more cursing. It reminds me of this unproduced Jaws script called Goners that never got made. It was set to come out after Serenity, but before Avengers, and was going to be a big tentpole for Universal. I'll link the script shadow review in the description below if you want like a bigger rundown of the actual story, but I read the script a few years ago, and suffice to say, it should have been sort of the writing on the wall for me that his work was going to stop meaning anything to me because it was getting so repetitive and so corny. Like, the story is basically about a bunch of people who are trapped on Earth, like their lost souls who are murdered or wronged in some way, and they can't go on to the afterlife until they rectify that in some fashion, but they all have superpowers based on how they were killed. So like the main character is a woman who was drowned and she has like water powers. There's a guy in the group who was a gay kid who was killed by being stoned in a hate crime, and now he has, like, Earth's rock powers. Like, it's, it's that kind of shit. And reading it makes me realize, like, one, it's very good that it never got made, because I think his, he probably never would have gotten to do Avengers, because, like, it, this movie would have tanked, it would have been a massive failure. Maybe a world where the MCU didn't actually take off could be better, but I don't know. Look, Joss Whedon has been trending in this direction for some time. Watching the show now, and thinking about that script, I'm reminded this is not some newfound feeling. Like, it's not like, oh, I don't like his shows anymore because I found out he's an asshole or whatever. It's really just that now it's just so much easier to recognize the things about his work that have gotten so, so irritating. Like, sure, Goner's had some exciting ideas and some cool moments and stuff, but it just felt like it was too bogged down by this one guy's vision, and it felt like it was stifled by something that could have been better with a different voice behind it. Just like this show. There are moments within the show that hint at interesting political commentary that I know full well Joss is just not capable of effectively exploring as a storyteller. It's just beyond his grasp. Chaos is not change. Shouting for recognition does not make a people worthy of it. There's a harmony to our world that's worth preserving. As I understand it, a harmony is made up of different voices sounding different notes. Yes, and one is always above the other. 
I know often people talk about separating the art from the artist, but in the case of critically engaging with Joss's work now, what we know about him as a person directly impacts readings of his work, and the hypocrisy at the core of his brand is too unavoidable to ignore. Which is why, knowing he's left the project with a new showrunner, I am genuinely considering sticking with the show. It's unlikely to get a second season, but the second half of its first is set to be done pretty much without him, and I'm curious to see what could happen with these ideas in his absence. The show's opening sequence is bland and dull to me, but it pays off big in the closing scenes, hinting at a scope for the series that could conceivably transcend what has been presented here. And to be honest, it made me want to give the show another chance. I mean, I probably won't, to be honest. Just me personally, I have a hard time keeping up with TV series. I don't really like watching a lot of things serialized anymore, so like, I probably won't watch more of the show. But I can see myself maybe giving it a chance once it's fully wrapped up. Like, I, I, I am curious to see where some of this stuff goes, even if the entire pilot to me reads as like, just a really bad rerun of songs I'd rather listen to on their own and not these weird, boring, new recording covers of them. But it says a lot to me that I am more interested in seeing a Joss Whedon show now that Joss Whedon has nothing to do with it. I don't think a creator getting his comeuppance has dovetailed so perfectly with his creative weaknesses being exposed since Max Landis got cancelled right when Bright came out. But here we are. So, are you guys gonna watch The Nevers? Have you seen it? Did you like it? Do you have thoughts about it? Do you wanna share them in the comments below? Please do. Uh, do you have your reasons for why you're not gonna watch it? Are you even aware that the show exists? Because the marketing has been very quiet. Uh, I'm curious, I wanna know your guys' thoughts. So, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you are not subscribed, please subscribe. Hit the little bell icon to get notifications when I put out new videos. I have more videos coming out later this week, as I always do. And yeah, please listen to the first episode of Triple Beam Streams. You will love this podcast. I have a ton of fun recording with the boys. It's like my favorite thing. I, I love it so much. Also, if you want another dose of podcasting for me, I also, this past week, guested on The War Report, also on RNC Radio, which is a show about the ongoing war between AW and WWE's NXT series on Wednesdays even though NXT is not on Wednesdays anymore. The War Report did a special episode about NXT TakeOver Stand and Deliver Night 2, and I got to guest on it and talk about some wrestling. You guys like hearing about that. And if you like me talking long for about some stuff, I will be announcing some other new podcast-related things in the near future, so stay tuned. Hope you guys are doing well, staying safe, being good to yourselves and each other, wearing your mask, getting vexed, getting vexed up. Yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one.